first of all, big thank you to Linda and Dorothea there for uh, their presentation. It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, the second part of the evening, we're going to be having, it's, it's more of a kind of informal conversation with uh, Sean Fitzgerald, who we have here today. Um, I have a wee introduction because I really thought today, well, we want to promote Ali Young, but I'd really love to make Sean feel incredibly awkward in front of a room full of people under lights. So, residing... I'll just go to the bar. <laughs> Sorry. Residing amidst the serene solitude of the remote northwest of Ireland, Sean Fitzgerald is a multi-talented artist and writer whose creative explorations delve into the enigmatic realms of Irish mythology, folk magic, Gnostic philosophy, and the mystique surrounding sacred sites. With a keen eye for the occult and a profound reverence for the esoteric, Sean Fitzgerald's work endeavours are captivating synthesis of ancient lore and contemporary interpretation. Through his evocative artwork, Fitzgerald ventures into the shadows of folklore, unearthing narratives brimming with both haunting beauty and visceral intensity. His pieces serve as a visual meditation on the intricacies of human existence, often traversing the boundaries between light and darkness, life and death, the seen and the unseen. Each stroke of his pen unveils layers of symbolism, inviting viewers into a realm where tradition interwines with innovation and where the subconscious whispers echoes of the past through the present. Sean Fitzgerald's distinctive style is marked by meticulous attention to detail, evident in the intricate knotwork that weaves throughout his compositions like a thread connecting the past to the present. His drawings, imbued with a sense of mystery and reverence, resonate with a primal energy that speaks to the depths of the human psyche. Beyond his visual artistry, Sean Fitzgerald is a wordsmith, weaving tales that blur the boundaries between reality and myth. His written works offer glimpses into hidden worlds and the ancient history of Ireland, where deities walk alongside mortals, and where the veil between the mundane and the magical is tantalizingly thin. In essence, Sean Fitzgerald is a modern-day bard, weaving tales of wonder and enchantment and casting light into the shadow and the recesses of the human experience. And through his art and his writings, he invites us to embark on a journey of exploration and discovery where the mysteries of the past converge with the possibilities of the future. So Sean, uh, introduce me. Go ahead. <laughs> um, that's Jonathan. His name starts with a J. And, um, <laughs> that, that, like, super, uh, nice, oh, well, that's super... Well, there we go. Amazing. Wow. No, um, it, it was kind of fun because the first time that uh, I was speaking to Daniel there while we had our intermission, and it was about this time last year that I actually came across Sean's artwork for the first time. And it was, Daniel showed me his, uh, his profile on Instagram and said, you really need to check out this guy. You need to see his illustrations. And I seen them and I just remember thinking, these are incredible. These are such amazing, striking images and completely fell in love with them. Uh, not too long after that, Daniel gave me a lend of his copy of Sean's book, The Last Bottle of Moitura, which is sat at the back of the room. And I would encourage you, if you didn't get a look at it during the intermission, <laughs> definitely go and have a check out of it. And it's one of those things where I, I've always had a belief where things cross your path when they're supposed to. And at the time that Daniel gave me a lend of that book, uh, we had had uh, a loss in the family at the time. And I always find that when you have moments where you need a little bit of escapism, sometimes those things just come your way. Because this was a book that I had wanted to have. I didn't know it existed, but I'd read so many books that were filled with stories of Norse mythology, Egyptian mythology, wonderfully illustrated. And I wondered where the book was of Irish mythology that had this very particular style of illustration. And suddenly there it was at a time when I needed it most. So I reached out to Sean and I asked him to come on a podcast that I was starting. He happily accepted and we sat down and connected that way. I had a great maybe hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half conversation. But one of the things that struck me at the time we finished recording and I looked at the acknowledgements in the back of the book, which at that point I hadn't read, and what was the first name in the acknowledgement? But Ali Young. I just thought, ah, oh, Jesus, there was so much we could have talked about there. But um, I suppose that's the best place to start with our, our evening all about Ali Young. George Russell was one of the other acknowledgements. But I was curious about then, what is it about A. Russell and about Ali Young that you would acknowledge them in the book? What, what kind of impact have they had on your work? Uh, well, uh, for me, Jonathan, you, you mentioned there was a, a bereavement in your family. Uh, for me, my dad died, this is like uh, 2010. And, you know, we've all had bereavements in our life. And he had like, a, sorry, I'm going to get a bit kind of low here, but he had like six months to live. It was pancreatic cancer. So I was looking after him. And it was very, it was, you know, it was tough going. And, you know, we've all had, you know, people who've died in cancer with us. And uh, so when he, when he died, I had like, I went into like, I, I suppose you call it kind of, um, 
uh, reactive depression. And so I used to go walking. And so I live uh, in the, just beneath the Derry Bay Mountains. And I'd go wandering up and you'd get to certain peaks and you'd see out and you'd see this Tory Island. And know Tory Island's one of the first, well, it is the first place mentioned in Irish mythology in, in our old uh, annuals. And uh, so I, I wanted to hear more, like you talk to people locally and, and you'd hear Balor and Lou, Balor and Lou and um, Balor of the Evil Eye lived on, on Tory Island. And so at the time, uh, because of the depression, I'd left my job. And so I had no money and I was listening to Eamon the Butler on, on the radio and he mentioned this website called archive.org, which archives all these out of print books. So I just put in the word Balor Lou and I came across um, the, the Coming of Lou by Ella Young, illustrated by Maud Gone. Now I knew Maud Gone, like, because when you're in school, she was the muse and that's all I knew about her in Yates. So it was like, Yates, oh yeah, yeah, you really fancy Maud Gone. And, um, so I was kind of really enjoyed the illustrations and uh, I didn't even know she was an illustrator, you know, because it was Yates, Yates, Yates. And growing up, I, I am a fan now, but I, I didn't, you know, when you're 16 and there's kind of a guy, gray hair, talking about picketed fences, it doesn't really, you know, um, no harm to the man. And uh, so I was looking at Ellie Young and, and her, so my, my family were, were from underneath my, my, my parents like are from underneath the Paps of Anu in a place called Guinea Gwilla, like the population's about 50. And there is a Shana Key there. It's a well-known Shana Key there. And I found her writing reminded me of, it wasn't like the way you'd read a, a story. It was like written in a very, like, you, you know, you'd say Shankus or, or, or Shana Key. It, it's like, it's a very different style of storytelling. Like it's, it's, it's very, like you could say it's simplistic, but it, it's, um, to me, there was like a nostalgia. I felt like, you know, geez, I could be related, you know what I mean? Or, or there was something, or, or she could have been a neighbor. There was something that really got to me. And, and it was the dad of my father. And it was kind of, there was kind of a link to it, you know? And, um, uh, so I, I started reading that and, and I just thought, this is amazing. Like, and, and then like anything, you know, you want to know about the writer. And then I read on Wikipedia, like, I, I don't know how true it is, but back then it was on Wikipedia and it said, oh, you know, she, she was like destroyed and she had like a purple robe and I stopped her going into the US because they said she was believed in fairies. I was like, she, she sounds fantastic. Like, <laughs> and uh, so I, there, uh, like you were saying, Linda, I couldn't find much. And um, I checked the census from, uh, was it LinkedIn? You know, the way you can see the Irish census for free. And I think it was LinkedIn 35 and it said, Religion, pagan. I'm like, jeez, why did you say that in 1935? <laughs> I was in 1911, sorry. Yeah. And, uh, That's even okay, better. 1911, <laughs> and you think like, like you know, so I, I, I was fascinated. And uh, so then I, I read Maud Gons, um, uh autobiography. Am I waffling too much about them? But anyway, That's Maud Gons. That's why you're here. Oh, yes, just, yeah. just to do okay, well, Maud, here Maud Gon, like she, like, again, the muse, you know, and it's like you read her book, and like Jesus, like talk about being underplayed. You know, we're, we're talking about Ella being underplayed, yes, obviously, but it's like, well, Gone was like a suffragette, she was a revolutionary, like as was Ella. And like, Ma Gone, they uh, Ma Gone, I think she started it, was the um, I'm gonna look at you, <laughs> she started like in and on Na Na Aaron, the daughters of Ireland, and uh. And they were like, they were, they were brilliant. Like they were, they were bringing stories to, to kids. Like, like if you imagine Dublin at the time, like, you know what I mean? These inner city kids and what they're doing, you know, these days you talk about privilege and people's privilege and, you know, to be like, oh, they're, oh, they're privileged. And you're going, when you, you look at it and like, they were using their privilege to, to really help and aid people. Like, and so she's gone off down to, sorry, Ella's gone off down to like, was it down to Connemara not or Kong, is it? And she's around with all these Shana Keys and she's learning the language and she's really like, um, I know they're heavily used, uh, influenced by uh, Stan Shagrady and stuff. So I started reading his stuff and didn't speak to me as much, like no harm to him, like, but it's like, um, so then of course you, you do the whole trail and you go on to AE. So AE, a friend of mine did the book, A uh, Candle of Vision, and if I'm honest, I, I didn't get into it. He was like, oh, like this is just going to open your mind, you know? And I was like, he said, I'm not getting into it. Like Ella Young for me is where it was Adam all gone. And uh, so they were mad. Like, so Ella Young and A were mad until William Blake, as was Yates. 
sorry, I keep on looking at you to kind of back me up or something. Like, yeah. <laughs> and um, so it's like, uh, they're really into William Nates and, 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 or sorry, William Blake, William Blake had this whole thing of, um, you know, the, the doors of perception, you know what I mean? That it opened your mind and, you know, it's, is it Huxley as well as all that kind of stuff. And you find with, uh, with Ellie Young and AE, it's like, they're just saying kind of open your imagination, like open, open it. Like, and, and so w- when you know that bit more about them, and you go to the writing and, and you're kind of like, they they were very different in that. Um, Linda mentioned earlier about the cultural and political reference to their work. And I think like they, they were interested in kind of, you know, consciousness, like themselves, the inner selves, but what's going on around them. And so what was going on around them was like inner city kids. Like, so I, I lived in Dublin for about nine years. And uh, so where Ella lived is a place, uh, Grosvenor, Grosvenor Square, is it? Have yeah, I got the name right? Yeah. And, and A was around there too. And around the corner, the Dubliners would have been known for mad parties back in the day and all this. And you look at the place and there's a bowling green in the middle. And I started relating to the more that like about maybe about an hour. I'm going to stop looking at it. About an hour, we'd walk into a like place where we're doing all these rituals in, in, in town, like where you're sharing a place with, with Gates and that. And, and it really it makes it very real. Uh, sorry, going back to the conscious and what was going on in Dublin at the time. So Dublin was like, you know, it was just absolute poverty. And then you had this um, group, the Daughters of Ireland, like the Neon the Heron, um, like the, what they were doing was amazing. And I, again, I think they're underplayed as well. It's just my opinion, but it's like AE, like they're doing all these um, plays. And I, I think as far as I know, AE was designing the dresses and the costumes and all this sort of stuff. And it, like they were kind of like, they're, they're, I don't know, were they like the, the goths or something of the time? You know, they were like the beatniks, you know, they were, they were like kind of, they were really doing their own thing, but it's like, um, you could see what they were into. Like, you, you could see, like she mentioned it there, when, when Linda, when, when you played Ella there earlier, I, I can't quote it, like, but she, she said something and it's like, it's a, a, like, you know, in Buddhism, you've, you've the, the death of the ego. And I think, this is my own personal opinion, I think they were bowed into this, the death of the ego because their work wasn't about them. It was very much about like changing people's consciousness. And it's like, <laughs> that, that, does not, that n- does not necessarily mean a spiritual content, it can be, but it's like they were bringing like, you know, we use words like cultural uh, regeneration and stuff like these days. And it was cultural regeneration. It was like, they were bringing this stuff back and knew that this is ours anyway. And we should be, you know, bringing it to the people of the street. So it was like, would say um, the daughters of, of Ireland were like they were, they were a mixture. Like they started by very, I suppose, middle class women, but it became a very mix of like working class and, and you know, it was a, a good, decent mix of, of people. And uh, I find the more I read, and I'd go back to her story, and, and you know, the more like any writer, you, the more you know about them, the story speaks to you more, and the story speaks to you more. So. The book, before I did the Moitura one, I started working on a book and I wanted to do the story. Everyone kind of used to speak about Lou and, and, and the God of Light and all this sort of stuff. And my original plan was to do the story of, of um, Penavelli Young mixing with Maud Gone and of a very different angle and how they would meet and go to places and discover places. But I just found, geez, this work is just too much. So anyway, the book, which I completely ripped off, uh, Ellie Young's Coming of Lou layout uh, was uh, a book called um, Lou Nabua, uh, Lou Deliver, which came out in, I don't know, it was 2017, I think. And uh, so then I decided I'd do my own. And so when I speak of ripping off, um, <laughs> so that's Maud Gone. Uh, and that's a, a beautiful, beautiful illustration from hers. And that's my version. Now, listen, I do have it written down along the side that, like, this is where it's from. And people will comment, and it's just like, again, we're, we're back to this underrated thing. Like, Maud Gone was, was an underrated illustrator. Her work is amazing. And, like, it, it, like they, they, were, they were good friends. Like, so I think they were sharing a flat in, or a house or something at the time. And um, to me, it just spoke volumes. It was like, they were using, so, like, actually, to go on to AE, I know I'm jumping the gun here, like, but, uh, so AE, I, I didn't get into Candle Village of, of Vision. And uh, so I was in five books in, in Derry uh, years ago, and I saw an AE book, and I said to him, I said, uh, how much is that? And he's asked ah, 150. 
<laughs> you really? Okay. And it was, but it was about, it was about uh, farming. And I was like, oh, yeah. But I started reading it. And, you know, these days we use words in, in, uh, in permaculture and, and modern uh, agriculture of like um, mutual aid, community farming. Here was AE using all these buzzwords back then. Like, I, look, I'm not, maybe it's 1912. I'm not too sure that book on, on, on farming that he had. And you're like, they were way before their time, like way before their time, you know? Uh, I really ranted there, but did that answer the that question? That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. But you I put it back away. at you, Jonathan. How, how did you get into Ella or AE? <sighs> well, I mean, I got into Ella through AE. The AE one was quite interesting because um, my partner, who was over here, now she lived in the house that A spent every second summer here in Armagh. There's a house at uh, Charles Shields' alms house. And a, a neighbor had left, I believe it was actually Michael's book here, over to the house one day and said, your, your house is in this book. And so Greta went and she was looking through it. And or I think we, we actually we knew that there was a painter or a writer. If I'm getting this wrong, feel free to correct me. And so we looked through the book and it was the house that you lived in, the house that you and your mom had stayed in and your sister. And this is the house that we were in. And this is, I, I believe it was A.E.'s grandfather, grandmother, and possibly aunt, if I'm right. It was their house, and this is where he spent the time. And Greta would always mention to me, you know, I'm kind of getting to a point where I was just, I suppose, discovering more of the kind of spirituality and the, the, the spiritual aspects of life. That was through Greta. You know, she was the leading light for me in a lot of ways with that because she was always very spiritually inclined. And she would always say that when she was in that house growing up, she would wake up in the night with poetry in her head, and she would just need to go and write this down. And so that kind of, I remember thinking, well, I need to look into this guy a little more. But at the time we were in the first lockdown and lockdown with, you know, a, a less than one year old and a three year old. Needless to say, I did not get looking into A. Russell at that point. And just last year before the start of the festival, Jim Conway was walking through the streets of Armagh while I was working the day job in the town. And he comes up and puts the pamphlet for last year's festival into my hand. And I look at the picture of the man on the front and I thought, this is that guy that I was supposed to look into. Mm -hmm. So we went down to the A. Russell Festival last year and we, we met Jim, we met Marianne, we met Patrick, we, we met the whole gang. And we just started falling down that rabbit hole of A. Russell. And as I fell down it, um, of course, he came into, you know, seeing Ali Young. And I'd seen the name a few times, and it wasn't until actually you had posted up a reading from Flowering Dusk last, oh, yeah. uh, just before Halloween, the Simon Eve. And you had mentioned about Celtic Wonder. Uh, funny, I'd just seen it the other day. You sent me a link to Celtic Wonder Tales, and that's where I went and went, oh, yes. So I went and ordered the book. And funnily enough, once again, I ordered the book, didn't have time to read it, and Greta went and read it first. And was like, you need to read this book, you know, <laughs> sort of hit me over the head with it going, would you do what you're supposed to be doing? But uh, so that brought me into Ali Young. And then just recently with uh, Dorothea's book, which again, the, the copy of it's down the back, a fantastic piece of research on the life mm -hmm. of Ellie Young. I started to discover more and more about who she was. And you see this, as you had mentioned, this revolutionary woman mm -hmm. who was, again, so far, uh, far ahead of her time. And I think that we live, like I've said, it's quite a lot to different people that spoke to it at craft fairs and so on, that we live in a world at the moment where I think people are as interested nowadays in the artist as they are in the art. People want to know the story behind it. And the more you look into A.E. Russell, the more you look into Ali Young, you're finding this backstory that enriches the work that they put out so much more. It, it makes A. Russell's painting so much more visceral. It makes Ali Young's writing so much more poetic when you understand the people that they were behind it. And so that was sort of my introduction to them. Mm. And while we talk about it, you'd also sent me these two illustrations, which before you sent me these, I had never seen these ones before. This is your illustration of A. Russell and your illustration of Ella Young. Yeah. Um, were they done for any particular reason? Were these stuff you did just personally? Because I had never well, seen them on any social medias or anything at all. I, I tried to draw Ella for, for a long time, and I think it's like um, a bit of hero worship going on. I, I know it's like it's not good to put people on pedestals, but here we are. But it's like... I heard that she'd like uh, really liked La Crew, so I put the Karen up there, and the rock art behind her is from La Crew. And um, then it was like we, you'd contact me about coming here, and I should say I'm very grateful to be here. Thanks very much. Um, 
And I said, geez, I've never drawn a picture of AE. And I was looking at pictures of him and um, I, I decided to do a younger AE. I, I, was trying to, I was trying to picture him, now when I say younger, maybe 30s, early 30s, when they met, when he met uh, Ella, you know. So what I wrote underneath it is, is one of the uh, sentences that really got me from the candle of vision was the, by imagination and will, we will re-enter the true being, becoming what we conceive of. I know we can take a lot away from different kind of quotes and stuff, but for me, that really just spoke volumes. Like it could have, for me, I thought it, it could have explained the whole book. It was just like, um, it's, it's like, you know, what it is, it's like, again, it's going back to the ego thing. They got rid of it and they, they were, they were doing like, you know, we live in an age now where everything's based on likes and approval and all this. They were just doing it like, and it wasn't about to be, um, again, like going back to what Linda was saying, like there were different times. Like, so it's kind of like a lot of the stuff they're into, like even, even like stating that she was pagan, stuff like that could get you into a lot of trouble, like, you know, and um, I, I think that's what I really admire. There were just such different times and it's to get into the mindset of then it's like they just did their own thing. And I, I wish people like, you know, we, we, we see in Irish mythology, uh, I think teaches it, uh, us a lot of stuff of like, you know, uh, J James O'Donnell, photographer down there. We we're chatting about like envy and, and how bad it is, like, and, and that there's a lot of envy can happen on social media with, with artists, photographers. And it's just like, uh, again, it's like it comes up in, in mythology. You'd have the envy with, um, I suppose, uh, Fiona Cool when he's older. Or there's, there's different, like, actually in Irish mythology identity politics comes into it too when you think of like the tr children of Lear they're like they're brought away they're now um, swans and they're tried their whole lives to come back and to find their identity and, and it's like again it's back to that uh, cultural regeneration and stuff but it's um, where was it going with that um, it's like I, I just find it's like the, the idea of envy I never it never struck me in any of their work it, there was like Yates, I'm sure was was doing great and and was the, this kind of overshadowed figure, but it's like it didn't strike it. I didn't spot it anywhere. It was like they did their thing and they did their thing, and, and that was it. Like, and you know, I think we could learn a lot from that. You know, yeah. I always find when you're talking about that idea of you know not doing that work without ego, and it's it's a big thing that people would talk about with a, and obviously a lot is made with his his relationship with Yeats and I always see them you know almost comically in how much they are that yin and yang mm. you know Yeats didn't ever strike me as someone who was probably like he was very much someone who seemed like he he loved a bit of validation he would love this social media people liking yeah, all of yeah, this yeah, stuff yeah, you know yeah, yeah, yeah. but again it, it does come across with a and, and certainly with Ella that that certainly isn't where they're coming from there was mm. I'd say a, a genuineness that comes across in not just their work but in their life and I think it was was a son that when he eulogized him, said that, you know, his life was his masterpiece. And I always thought that line sort of stuck with me because I thought it was just a really perfect way of summarizing it, but also so I mean, what an incredible way to be remembered for people to think about you and your life's work in that context. And it was always something that really struck me about it. Mm. Um, the, the Ellie Young illustration here, I, I was kind of looking over it the other day. Um, the one thing that I was quite interested in, in asking you about is... I see when I look at Ella, like this is such a good likeness of her. Like the, the illustration, there's no mistake. And if you're aware of Ella Young, that this is Ella Young that you're looking at. And as I kind of inspected the illustration more and more, in terms of the face itself, you've managed to do so much with so little. There, there's not a tremendous amount of line. Mm -hmm. Shading is relatively minimal within it. And yet the likeness of it has come across so well. Is, is this something that is requiring? A lot of experimentation for you to get to that finished piece or how exactly do you come across being able to visually communicate her portrait in such a minimal way um it's it's you know it is it's like see with the ae one um that was done in a week so it was like i had to scribble and there's lots of scribbles yeah. and cross hatching was that like i made loads of attempts at that uh, I'd, I'd read somewhere that she really likes swans so I was like trying to put in a swan and I was trying to wrap her in a swan and it just looked really cheesy. And um, so it was like, I, I was like, okay, well, like her thing was mountains. Like, uh, did she mention in that audio piece you played, Linda, was like, 
you know, she was on about, you know, to, um, the more you say hello to a mountain, the mountain will say hello back to you, you know? And, uh, so I was kind of going, well, that's where her heart is. Like, and she was on about like, uh, ancient temples of like how you, you'd bow down and that you're, you're going lower and then you're getting higher. So at Loch Crew, that's Karn, is it Karn T, James? I can't remember which one it is. And it's like, so it's the one is like, you go in and you crawl under exactly how she explained. And then you're in an open space. Um, so I thought that would kind of link in. She mentioned that there's lots of different places that um, she mentions it. So I I was drawing different versions of the car and going this way and that way. So it's like, it might look sometimes that maybe it's quickly done, but it, you, you know yourself, like you were chatting earlier about your piece, yeah. the one here in our bar of, of, of um, Omaka. Yes. Um, and it's like, you know yourself, you, you're constantly changing it. At the end, you're kind of go, oh, right, yeah, you know, it's like, Something like might look simplistic, but like anything, like writing or anything, there's so much put into it. Do you want to tell your story about your uh, piece? Yeah, well, I'll skip a few frames down to get to it because I was going to talk about it in a little bit. There was a piece uh, that I had started. It was down on the table there. Oh, we're just in, a, in an other place. There we are. It was a piece that I did of uh, Awamaka, of Navinfort, and I tried to create something that was a little bit contemporary, a little bit abstract, but showing off the locations of the site. Now, interestingly, and I've never put that up anywhere, I did, before I do anything, like the roughest sketch of roughly what I think something's going to look like. And I just had this idea of overlapping shapes, kind of referencing the idea of network, but in just a very kind of unusual way. And I had did the initial sketch for this before I went to last year's A Russell Festival. And obviously we were so much so busy going to different events over the course of it that I, I just did that quick little rough sketch and said, I'll get back to it afterwards. And at the time in that left-hand piece, you can see that the underground area that I had initially thought of, there was like a table and you had like a high king, there was a puka, a giant, there was a banshee. The idea I had was I wanted to reference the kind of pagan and pre-Christian history of the Navin Fort. And I thought at the time, well, I'll put in these characters from Irish mythology and I'll, I'll, that'll be the way to communicate it. And then, of course, we went to the A Festival and I got to sort of be introduced to A's paintings. I got to see so much of the great work that was on display here in the museum at the time and listen to all the talks by Jim, by Michael, by Patrick, by everyone who was there. And I seen A's spiritual paintings, the way he depicted the she, the way he depicted all of these spiritual beings that he was seeing. And he had a way of showing them where they were these ethereal characters. They were these kind of light beings that were standing amongst uh, these different scenes in, in rural Ireland or on beaches in Donegal. And I just remember thinking, oh, I really love that idea. And another element that I seen throughout A. Russell's paintings was he would always have women depicted in different stuff like the Potato Gallers piece. And it was always usually three women. There seemed to be something within his pieces that he was including three women to write these paintings. So then I kind of thought, right, well, maybe I'll do three women and I'll make them light in this ethereal sort of figure as a little kind of nod to this fantastic artist that I'd just really fallen down the rabbit hole with. So the final piece ended up being the underground of the Navin Fort was shown depicting these kind of ethereal light women that were dancing around the fire. And that was a way that I thought that I would reference that kind of pre-Christian history of the uh, of Awamaka. So brilliant. Uh, and just to pop back up, because again, I'm slightly gone a little out of order, uh, we're moving into then kind of the last battle of Moitura, the, mm. the book that was sat down at the bottom of uh, at the bottom of the room there. Now, this was a book that whenever I looked through it, just completely blew my mind. You know, I, I was this was a book that I dreamed of having, and suddenly it was there. It had been made. And one of the things that I find very interesting is, first of all, I was blown away by the intricacy of some of the network that you'd put into it. I mean, even on this back cover. That's you could get lost in so many of those details that are included in it. But one thing that really came across in your artwork was this connection with nature. There was there was themes of nature always working in through the knotwork. There were leaves, there were plants, but the nature was something that really kind of stood out to me. And I, I remember thinking, well, you've got A. Russell, you've got Ellie Young, two people who, by their own admission, throughout their own writings, have talked about how they had a very deep connection with the natural world around them, and it was a source of solace it was a source of inspiration i was wondering with your own illustrations is that something do you work in this nature is it just because you feel it looks nice is there a connection that you have with the land that you feel that that's how it works itself into your work or is there any connection that you would find with the land yourself 
um, <clears throat> it really goes back to to what I was saying earlier about Ella, and uh, it was like it started off as reading the landscape. So walk along the hills, let's say, um, reading Ella. So I, I, I camped out there when it was really cold and it seemed like a good idea. And I thought it was like a really spiritual thing. To do. It's freezing. And, um, but it was, it was interesting, but it was like the landscape thing really got me and, and the old Irish name. So where we are, um, uh, we live in a, a place called, uh, uh, Clahanili, right? Um, this clock, Keown Naila, and it's like the head of Keown McAneely. And it, it links into mythology. So the local folklore links into old written Irish mythology. So the landscape to me was very much part of the story. And that was very much um, what I got out of Ella is after a while, but it, it took me a while to, to kind of know her character um, first. But um, so to me, it was like the, the stories were so part of the landscape. It was all around us and it's kind of like no matter where you live in the country you know what i mean there there'll be something there'll be a name there'll be something and uh so i thought the nature aspects very much you know i thought would link it away or, or sorry would link it in to the story um so all around us like especially in the mountains there it's like ferns they're everywhere and uh and then of course the, the stag's head <clears throat> i think it has this um you know, when you look at, uh, so it mentions the Dagda and that. And one of the names for the Dagda is Furben, which means a uh, pigged man, like something like a horned figure. So it kind of, the horned figure kept on coming up in, in different old Irish names. There's, uh, what's the other one? Corridarag, um, which would be like another the peaked, another peaked horned figure. So I just thought it would be very good. So that's um, the Morrigan in the front. So I'd read different things about the Morrigan and I don't know, kind of like what you were doing when you went to the AE um, talk and then redid your drawing and stuff after listening was like, I'd drawn um, the Morrigan and then I was like, you know, the representation, if, if I'm honest, of, of the Morrigan that I saw online was a very gothy, very sexy kind of woman. And I wanted to portray a kind of a, an older, powerful, like, um, I suppose, like magical type of uh, woman. Um, so that's what I was trying to portray. So then I was like, well, I better link. What, like, why do I think the Morrigan is like this? So you go back and there was little things you'd read of like, you know, the, the bird skull it, it links into Bath, the other part of the three Morrigan. The, the lips was like, her lips were like the, the blood of, like a lot of it links to kind of battle kind of imagery. And then rather than having the, the glory of battle, uh, which is portrayed a lot in kind of fantasy, I wanted the absolute annihilation behind her. And um, so when I did the book and I, I showed the cover, they were like, no one's going to buy this book. Um, so it's just like I wanted, like, so my previous book to that, um, it's like the heroic blonde haired figure of Lou going into battle and, I like it, you know, but I just thought that it spoke more to me about battle rather than glorifying battle because, of course, the Morrigan is known for um, giving a big prophecy at the end of that battle. But um, anyway, to go back to the, to the whole thing, is it's like the knot work, it links into the stories, again, much like your drawing where you hear it. Like Again, like when I first saw that drawing that you did, I was kind of going, um, I, I, like I didn't know you, but I, I kind of figured it was somebody who lived in Irma, if not from Irma, because Normia would be portrayed as maybe Maka, and we're used to a very sexy kind of figure. And uh, to me, it was like, you know, the landscape, you know, yeah. the hilly landscape, and you could see the whole thing in your drawing. So similar to your own, to be honest with you, Donathan, yeah, yeah. And as I said earlier, you know, with the book, Ali Young, Celtic Wonder Tales, uh, written down as the very first acknowledgement in this book. And I was always interested about where your kind of opinion would fall on um, the issue of, I, I think there are some people on a certain sort of section that if you were to interpret Celtic mythology or rewrite Celtic mythology, or, or any mythology for that matter, it can be a sensitive subject for some people because there are people who will hold those stories in very high reverence. They will be not just characters and stories and mythology, there'll be a religion to them, there'll be something that's very deep, very personal, very sacred to them. And I remember reading uh, Ellie Young, Celtic Wonder Tales, 
not long after I had read Gods and Fighting Men by Lady Augusta Gregory. And there were the same stories told in vastly different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, with Lady Augusta Gregory's Gods and Fighting Men, you have this recounting of Irish mythology in a very kind of direct translation. It, it's very to the point. It's very concise. Whereas when I read Celtic Wonder Tales, you could see that Ali Young had infused her personality. She had infused mm. her soul and her love of Celtic mythology. She had literary flourishes in here. She had added so much to that book that truly made it her own. And of course, there were things that she was adding. There were things that she was changing. She certainly used creative license within it. Um, how do you fall within that sort of debate where people might not be particularly pleased for lack of a better word, with people changing bits of mythology. And, and when you sat down to write the book, was that ever something you were conscious of? <clears throat> or were you happy to just, you go in there and you know you have that creative license to basically do what you want within this world? Uh, well, Ella Young, I think like it's, it's not like she changed loads. Like To me, so uh, you have your Shanaki, right? that's a storyteller. Then you have a Shankus, and a Shankus is like, it's a conversational story. It's relaxed. And you could actually talk back as I was telling the story, you know, it's just like a traditional way of storytelling. And to me, I think Ella had all that, those elements. So it was, it was a relaxed storytelling. It was like, and again, it, the wording, the words were, there was an older feel to it. Whereas you now uh, Lady Gregory and all that, like that book is one, like I was a teenager when I first got that and it's a fantastic book. Um, but it's like, there is, you're right, like it's a huge difference. You know what it is? I, mm, it depends how much you're changing. Like you do read stuff and you're like, ah, geez, you know, you're jumping all over the place. But I, I think it has to be classified as something else. It's like, this is fantasy and we've taken these characters. And uh, you see, I know personally, I was kind of, uh, I, I was going with like archaeology. I was like, oh, that would be there and that would be here. But again, I fuse my name with folklore, local folklore, which is slightly different than um, uh, written Irish mythology. So again, this is my opinion. I have nothing to back this up with, but I would believe Ella was doing something very similar because she had heard the folkloric stories of a lot of these, and I believe she learned that style. So that's why it's, it's very different than Lady Augusta because I think Lady Augusta was trying to... Um, she was trying to record and, 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 and keep this stuff for us. Like, you know, whereas I think Ella was keeping a tradition of storytelling. That's my opinion. You know, what do I, you think? Well, it was interesting because I've not jumped too much into depicting too much figures from Celtic mythology. The, the only one that I've really done, which was later on down here, was uh, the illustration of Maha at mm. the mind of the Navan Fort. And I actively wanted to do something different with that illustration, because obviously being from Armagh, I, I had sort of a deep connection to the story. I was familiar with it. I, it was a story that I, I absolutely loved. The, the Navin itself is just one of my favorite places to be. It always has been. We, for different reasons, as a child, it was our favorite place to go to because we took our bikes up there and we would fly down the hill with reckless abandon in bikes that didn't have brakes and fall into hedges. And struggle home and then as I get a little bit older you kind of go there and you feel that there is there's this energy to this place there's a magic to that place and it's it's so visceral you feel it when you stand at the mound at the Navin Fort you feel the energy of that place it's it's palpable it's in the air and I knew that I wanted to depict Macha in a very different way because for me I always felt that the way people depicted her was very much her inner fury her as she curses the men of Ulster. And that's not quite the way I wanted her to be portrayed. Um, I kind of felt that I remember reading Ellie Young's Celtic Wonder Tales, and there is the, the very opening of that book, Ella writes about uh, Bridget, and it's the sort of creation myth, if, if you will. And there's a way that she writes about Bridget and how the other gods are around her, and they almost hold her in this motherly reverence within that start of it. And Bridget, in that very, very beginning of Celtic Wonder Tales, you can see this, you know, through her words, she is painting this picture of this serene, caring figure that all the other gods have just such a, a deep respect for. And I kind of thought, okay, well, I really, really like this. 
And part of the story with, with Maka, for anyone who doesn't know, she's pregnant with twins. Later, she's made to race the king's horses, and that ultimately results in her death and her putting the curse on the men, well, a curse and a blessing on the men of Ulster. The blessing is that they will be the best warriors in Ulster, however, at the time, or in Ireland, and at the time when they need that strength the most, it would abandon them. And I kind of didn't quite, I don't connect on a personal level with putting a curse over an entire country. I don't know about anybody else. I don't often run around cursing entire countries. It's not something that I really get into. And as well as that, so much Celtic mythology was depicted with the battle. As you were speaking, it's glorified battle in a lot of ways. And again, I don't run around too many fields with axes, not all that often. And I thought about what was the human point of contact for this character? What is a thing that an audience can see in this story and really connect to? So I started to think about, well, Maka when she was pregnant, you know, the, the love of a mother. Uh, having two children and, and watching my partner go through the whole childbirth process, you see this unconditional love that is unlike anything else in the world. The love of a mother is something completely different. And I wanted to capture not just the love of the mother, but of course the tragedy of the story of Maka. Of course, she is carrying twins that ultimately, if she's another worldly being, if she's going to have some idea of what the future holds for, she will know that she won't be around for those children. She won't get to experience all the joys that a mother would. So I initially began by drawing just the figure. It was a, an ink sketch of the figure of Maha here holding the, uh, the baby bump. And um, Greta, my partner, came down the stairs. She seen this illustration and instantly she had a connection to the black and white sketch of it. And she took, she took the sketch and she went and she sat with it. And as I'd mentioned, you know, she was kind of my introduction to a lot of spiritual stuff. And she felt a connection with Maha looking at the piece. She got a very, very strong feeling of there are certain things that she would want in this illustration. There's certain aspects that you need to include in it. So we kind of began to, I suppose, produce this piece as a bit of a collaboration between my illustration and the message, the feeling that she was getting, this channeling that she was getting. So along with that, I went on to kind of rewrite the Maka story to fit with this, what I feel was a unique depiction of her. And I wrote a story of Maha when she's heavily pregnant with her twins and she goes into an ancient forest. This was her going out and she connects with an ancient ruin tree. The, the roots go to the underworld and she receives the vision of what is to come. So she will know what her future entails. And I wrote that. I posted it up when the illustration went up. And for the most part, I got people saying, you know, oh, it's really good. Really love the illustration. Really like that story. But there were a few people who... And it wasn't just online. I've had it at a craft first before, and people have just very casually said, well, that's not part of the story. And I'm just like, oh, <laughs> all right then. And so that was the first time I became aware of some people might take a little bit of kind of offense to, now, in all fairness, I completely added stuff to this myth, to the story that wasn't there. But I kind of felt that there are parts where there seem to be missing links in stories. And I thought that that's a fun playground to have. It would be good to go into these kind of untrodden places and link stories together in little bits where perhaps there isn't details, perhaps there's mm. little parts of the story. And I remember the first time I thought about it was there's an early part in, uh, I believe it would be in the first battle of Moitur. It would be the Fir Balog and the two of the Danon are having their war. And there was a part in the particular book, I believe it might've been in Lady Augusta Gregory's Gods and Fighting Men where the Fir Bala are in their camp and they're preparing for war with the two of the Danon. And there are some, I believe it was druids, kind of leave the Judadan camp and they put this kind of magical spell over the Firbala and their camp is cast into darkness and they're, they're trapped there for something like three days. I might get the details wrong on it. But then it just immediately we're talking about them going to battle. And I thought, well, no, what, what happened then? Mm. That's, they're there, they're in their camp, they're preparing for war, they're suddenly cloaked in darkness for three days. Mm. And we don't mention anything that happened. I checked Google Maps where they were, and it yes. mentions the place. And like you're talking like another three days walk after that. Uh, I had the same question. I just skipped, yeah, yeah. and I remember thinking, those are the areas that I would like to play in. I would like to write those parts of the story yeah. that don't seem to be there. But some people, I know it's a small minority, but I was just very surprised when people seem to really have a bit of an issue with uh, you, you can't please everybody. Like, it's a beautiful illustration. Like, oh, I. Going back to what you said a couple of years ago, uh, I'm going to try and get a long story and make it really short, but uh, I, was, I was on the Hill of Tara 
like there was right wing kind of groups going up there, right? And um, so I had the bright idea. I had a drawing of Lou on a horse, and I, I put a pride flag on the thing. Not hell, bro. It was. It was. Yeah, I, I kind of blocked comments. I was getting like, um, "You were a traitor to Lou. You're a traitor. You're not Irish. You're." You'd be hung. You, you know, there was like, it's too boring to go into it. And I was just like, this is, this is frightening. Like, um, and like, I knew what I did, but it's like, I come on. Like, you know what I mean? They didn't have a pride flag back then to fly. Like, you know what I mean? It's just like, it's a, it's obviously a modern version, but, um, it was, yeah, it went on for ages. It, it was like, it was really completely over the top. Um, but yeah, it was like in saying that though, this, the same drawing was used for the, it's now the logo for the first uh, Pride in the Gweltuct, which is broad. So it kind of, it had a nice little happy yes. ending and they hung it up in Dublin Castle. So you're kind of there going, eh, you know, maybe all that kind of crap <laughs> online wasn't too bad after all, you know. But it, it's like, you can't win. And, and it's like, someone could go, oh yeah, but why is there three, three trees there, Jonathan? There's, there's, it's not three there in that picture. Well, the trees you can't are win, like, the same uh, trees. They're yeah, the rolling so. tree from the story, and I completely just went and changed that as well. But no one's no one shouted at me yet for that. I haven't Good. had the Navin heritage people are, aren't shouting at me <laughs> for my slight change of the trees. But uh, we did, there was a few illustrations I had up here of, of A. Russell's. We were going to possibly discuss it. We're, we're quite pressed for time, so we're just going to kind of I'll put them up on the screen. These were incredible illustrations that are housed here in the Armagh County blocking. Museum. They are illustrations by A. Russell. Um, when we first ever started talking about ideas for this evening, there was a plan that I'd wanted to get Sean and Jim Fitzpatrick and we would do a whole presentation all just about A's illustrations. Perhaps that may be something we get an opportunity to do at a later date. Jim wasn't able to be here. But uh, when we're doing events down in Dublin for the Society, keep a wee eye on us or even follow us our we mailing list because that's something that I would love to do at a later date. I'll kind of take, quickly scroll through them. They're all housed here in the County Museum. Uh, these were all untitled illustrations A it did or a manuscript of poetry, but they're fantastic. Wow, that's they're amazing, amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And it's one of those things that we talk about, A, being a guy who had so many strings to his bow, and not a lot of people talk about, well, people don't talk about him as much as they should, but when they do, they talk about his mysticism, they talk about his paintings, they talk about his poetry, his, his agricultural reform. The illustrations are another area of A that there's not a tremendous amount of them, but they do not get anywhere near the love that they should because it's just absolutely remarkable yeah. stuff. Beautiful, beautiful pieces. Really I like with really the ones of the she. It's like when you read some of the older mythology. Yeah, that say like how tall they were and the light, and you see that like, like well, to me, he's one of the first really I think who caught that. Like, you know what I mean? It's like they're they're absolutely amazing. They're magnificent, and again, we'll we'll hopefully have a later event where we do get an opportunity to really sort of crack on into them. And I just think that to me these things don't happen by accident. And there's, there's an energy that we have around us at different points throughout history. And there's an energy happening at the moment, which I think the time is right to continue writing, painting, drawing, promoting these people who held ideals that we could learn a whole hell of a lot from today. And we just need to keep pushing on that and making sure that the message that we put out there is the right one, because this is the message that ultimately falls on the right side of history. 